Hello there, Professor George here. I'm going to start with our first lecture in our third series, which is about form and structure in pieces of music. Um, so the first topic of our conversations are going to be about um, Sonata Allegro form. We're gonna talk about the history of the symphony um, and how form ends up being an idea or uh, sort of a uh, structural constraint that is both replicated on the large scale and the small scale, or the ma macro and the micro form of a piece of music. Um, so to investigate this idea, we're gonna talk about the symphony, uh, and very importantly, the first movement of the symphony. So uh, what's best to do at this point is to grab your, your one page that I made for you, um, called Dualities and Developments, Sonata Allegro Form, and the History of the Symphony. Um, essentially, what I go over here is more or less what I'm going to be lecturing about, although in a little bit greater detail, specifically when it comes to the listening examples. So for this particular lecture, we're only going to actually be going through three different listening examples, uh, tracing the development of, the, of Sonata Allegro form um, from the classical era into the late Romantic era. So to do so, we're going to be talking about Mozart, about Beethoven, and about Schubert. Um, <clears throat> Sonata Allegro form is a fairly intricate form. Um, in order to discuss form, we need to kind of even figure out what, what form means in terms of music. So form. Uh, when I'm discussing form, I'm talking about the ways in which different ideas repeat themselves in a piece of music. Uh, in an earlier lecture, I alluded to the fact that uh, because music is an intangible form, uh, typically, as listeners, we're not asked to remember too many different musical ideas, especially if we're only getting to listen to a piece of music once, which is generally the assumed thing. So um, being able to follow a composer's structure uh, clearly is really up to the composer. So um, Sonata Allegro form, we're going we're to talk, talk about the um, what I call the prototypical diagram of the Sonata Allegro form first. Mozart follows this form, form most closely, um, Beethoven slightly less so, uh, and Schubert makes a number of uh, very interesting deviations from the form. Um, when uh, we're discussing form, like I said, we're talking about the repetition of different ideas. Um, and Sonata Allegro form really uh, is about two, for the most part, two, two different contrasting ideas. Uh, and even so, the, the first movement of the symphony is generally where the composer is able to showcase his or her kind of um, um, most confident compositional abilities. Uh, uh, it's uh, what's called a developmental form, and it's because it goes through a section uh, in, the, in the middle called the development section. Um, in any event, we're going to draw out the form from start to finish, the prototypical diagram, and like I said, follow the uh, deviations that each of those three composers makes. Um, very good. Uh, before we discuss Sonata Allegro form, let's talk about the form of the entire symphony itself. Uh, so a typical symphony uh, has four different movements. And the idea be between and among the, the, the movements is to create an internal contrast. So each of the movements has a form of its own, uh, but symphonic form is the idea of having four different movements, which are roughly cataloged um, as having um, a couple of different characteristics. This is a good point to travel over to my whiteboard so we can start taking notes together. Hold on for just a moment. Okay, we're back. Let's talk about the macro form of the symphony. So like I said, a symphony is a four movement form and the idea is to create contrast uh, between and among those movements. So um, macro form. Of the symphony. So the first movement uh, typically is something we call sonata allegro form. Very specifically, it's a kind of form that includes a very special section called the development section. <clears throat> 
Uh, typically, this is where, like I said, the composer is able to showcase his or her sort of um, most impressive compositional abilities. Uh, typically, sonata allegro form is indeed allegro, so that it generally is a fast movement or uh, somewhat quick, which means that the second movement has to create a contrast, which typically happens in terms of tempo. So the second movement, in order to create that, um, that feeling of uh, moving on to a different section entirely is going to create as many uh, characteristic changes as, as possible. Um, so it's, again, first movement, sonata allegro form, a developmental form, it's gonna kind of be a quick and energetic piece. Uh, so the second movement in order to contrast is going to usually be an adagio, or rather like a slow movement. This doesn't always have to be the case, but typically um, also as a point of contrast from the first movement, the second movement um, has one thematic idea versus the first movement having two thematic ideas. So it feels a little bit more straightforward and a little less complicated. Uh, the third movement, again, in order to create a contrast from the second movement uh, is going to uh, be a somewhat smaller and um, uh, more lighthearted kind of form. So it usually is like a minuet, a scherzo, um, or uh, something that has a, what we call it, a, a trio or like a, a smaller section within the movement. Um, minuet, uh, 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 generally these, these forms are the, uh, for the third movement are almost dance-like in their approach or they can be occasionally. Uh, a scherzo is a musical joke in terms of its translation. Uh, I happen to like uh, the scherzo movements uh, quite a bit when it comes to symphonic form, but it's really up to the composer. Something that's going to create a contrast though from the second movement, which is typically a little bit more slower, more labored, uh, perhaps even a little bit more somber. Um, okay, so the last movement, the fourth movement, uh, is usually an allegro, a rondo, or a sonata. So there is some amount of connectivity between the first and the, the fourth movements. Um, not to say that any of the thematic ideas are necessarily replicated in the fourth movement, uh, but they're both uh, sort of up-tempo in terms of feeling. Um, the first movement oh, almost always historically has a development section. Uh, the fourth movement can, but typically is a little bit more straightforward um, than the first movement. So we have this sort of, um, the, the beginning and end have a kind of relationship to one another, more so than the internal two movements. So what happens on the large scale, the macro form also kind of happens within the, the micro form or the smaller scale of the, the piece of music. We're going to really pick apart all of the different elements of just the first movement. So each of these different movements has, like I said, an internal form of its own. The first movement is by far the most complicated one uh, and definitely the most interesting uh, to study from an analytical point of view. Um, some very interesting things happen in Sonata Allegro form. So let's talk about what the uh, Sonata Allegro form looks like in terms of a prototypical diagram. Um, all right, Sonata Allegro form. All right, the first section, I'm gonna, um, you're gonna notice I'm not gonna start all the way to the left-hand side of the, the screen. There's going to be an optional section we sometimes encounter. Um, it's kind of a 50-50 split as to whether composers include this section or not, um, but often enough where I will include it in our prototypical diagram. Uh, so because it's optional, we'll, we'll, get, we'll get back to it. Um, there's a section that happens before this first initial section. Um, this first big section we call the exposition. 
the exposition. Its job is to expose, and that's how you're gonna remember this section, expose, exposition, is to expose our thematic ideas. Um, how many exactly? Well, I've already told you that uh, Sonata Allegro form is a developmental form, and in order to be a developmental form, um, y y we're gonna have to uh, uh, develop and kind of pivot at least, um, and in the most cases, two different ideas against one another. So the exposition is sort of your, your kind of thesis statement as a composer. Uh, it's telling the listener what the main ideas are to listen to. So the first thing that we listen to in the exposition, this first larger section, is called theme one. Whatever we hear first, uh, unless it is the introduction, is going to be our first thematic idea. So we start off here. Here's our theme one. Awesome. Like I said, uh, we have two uh, different ideas that we're going to explore in the exposition. So the next thing that we're going to do is have a statement of theme two. Awesome. Uh, you'll notice that I put theme one and theme two on different planes. Uh, we're going to talk about why that is in a little bit. Um, it, regard, it, it, it corresponds to the uh, key signature or the tonality that each of the thematic ideas is in. Um, again, we'll get to that momentarily. Theme one and theme two. Um, the idea is compositionally theme one and theme two have to have some sort of contrast between them. Um, so uh, if theme two happens to be sad in characteristic, perhaps it is in the minor mode, um, something about it sounds um, brooding or uh, perhaps even frustrated, um, it, we're gonna, it, it's going to have maybe like that particular quality. As a composer, if we're going to really um, do a good job of leading the listener through Sonata Allegro form, we have to create a contrast. So if theme number one is sad or angry, theme number two is going to be happy or elated. Um, it could be in the major mode. Let's say um, the first thematic idea favors uh, the woodwind family. Perhaps by contrast then, the theme two might favor the brass family. So again, between theme one and theme two, there is a point of contrast. One of the things that helps define this point of contrast is the idea that each of these thematic ideas is actually in a different key. Um, we are going to talk more in depth about key relationships later, but for right now, theme one happens to be in a key area we call the tonic. Okay, um, if it happens to be uh, the tonic, in this case, we're just going to create an example, is going to be in the key of C major. Typically, theme two, then, is in what we call the dominant. A key relationship that is, is five diatonic or uh, uh, scale degrees um, away from our first key. So, um, if our first theme is in C major, C, D, E, F, G, our second thematic idea is going to be in the dominant and therefore uh, G. And in fact, whoopsies, um, well, that eraser is huge. Too small. Um, in fact, just according to my diagram, um, I am going to make this C minor, because we talked about it being sad or upset in terms of its um, tonality, uh, and this one G major. Okay, awesome. All right. So in order to uh, connect 
theme one and theme two, typically we have what we call a bridge. Compositionally, sometimes this is actually like, like a comma, a, a breath mark, or even uh, sometimes a pause. A very, very, very short. Um, in order to help us feel like we're coming to an end here and in a bigger extent here, we have these things called cadences. These cadences are generally an alteration between two different chords, two different sonorities. And the, they're actually a reiteration of the only two sonorities that we have listed here, a reiteration of going between one and five, somewhat repeatedly. All right, it's so important to us as listeners that we understand what's happening in the exposition that the composer actually repeats the whole thing for us. So we listen to the exposition, we go through it, once, then we come exactly right back to the beginning and listen to it without any change whatsoever. Awesome. Something that typically precedes the exposition is a section we call the introduction. Uh, the introduction is typically uh, short, quite short, two measures, four measures, eight measures, maybe maximum 16. Um, does not take a particularly long time. Um, usually, uh, that introduction, the job of it is to set us up for what's going to happen in theme one. You'll notice that it's also on the same harmonic line as theme one. So in terms of its key structure, it is also trying to reiterate the importance of the tonic. Um, the fact that C minor is where we start. Uh, C minor is important to us because it's going to sound like home, our home base, where we feel most comfortable. Um, I, the next place that we travel to harmonically feels like our best friend's house. Uh, it, it's, it's somewhere we're very familiar with um, it, because we spend a lot of time there. Uh, in, C, in C, we actually spend some uh, amount of time in, in G. Uh, it's a sort of a, a pillar of stability, gives us a little bit of variation uh, without kind of disrupting the order of things. Um, but so far, the introduction and the exposition feel very, very safe. Nothing is too turbulent. Uh, nothing is uh, too radical. Um, in order to help distinguish the introduction from the exposition, we actually have a change in texture. So the introduction typically is uh, monophonic. It's, it's very attention grabbing. Uh, everyone is starting together. Uh, whereas the exposition, in order to create a little bit of variety, uh, but still to be easily understood because we, we need to understand what theme one and theme two are, uh, it's typically homophonic in texture. All right, very good. The next section is uh, the way in which Sonata Allegro form gets its, its name. It's a developmental form because the, 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 the biggest uh, um, kind of deviation where everyone gets to make the Sonata Allegro form the most personal, it, it happens within the development section. All right. Development. So the development section feels incredibly chaotic. It kind of feels like that squiggle. Um, what happens in the development? Theme one is usually pivoted against theme two. Hopefully the first thing this makes you think of is what's gonna happen texturally. Theme one versus theme two, Marco versus Polo. What does that mean? I'm sure everyone in class right now would say heterophonic texture. Also, theme one 
upset, theme two, particularly happy, right? We have two ideas that are um, purposefully set apart from one another. In the development section, we can set them on top of one another at the same time. So we get things like non-imitative polyphony. There is almost always a very elongated game of Marco Polo that happens in a development section. Um, but the idea is for us to feel turbulence in terms of listeners. Um, so also in order to create this point of contrast for us to feel like we've moved on to another section, we do need to do something texturally different. Um, so our exposition is homophonic in texture. Our development section has to do something that's um, a little bit more radical. In terms of key relationships, we also need to feel like we've moved away from home. Um, so in this case, the development section, you can travel harmonically to anywhere but the tonic and the dominant. So the only two keys that you're not allowed to be in are like C minor, in this case, or G major. We want to feel like we've gone somewhere. Um, and one of the ways that we can do that is harmonically shifting our focus. Um, by doing so, when we eventually return to C minor, it will feel like we have come back to the point where we started. Um, and that actually leads me to talk about our next section. something we call the recapitulation. Recapitulation, recap. Um, during the recapitulation, we have absolutely no new ideas that are, that are stated. Um, in fact, uh, and let me kind of vary this diagram a little bit. We actually kind of, go back to our, our first uh, key area. So we have a presentation of theme one that's followed by theme two, but notice that theme one and theme two are, are on the, the same line now. Um, this means that instead of kind of ramping up our energy to go back to um, to go back to the, the dominant, we're actually just going to continue um, going, uh, presenting our material in, in the tonic. So here's our return to the tonic. Um, but this is theme one. And this is theme two. So if we were really, uh, minding the diagram in its, its fullest kind of capacity. We would have a uh, theme, one would be sad in theme, uh, C minor as it was before. And then theme two would actually also be presented in the same key. So it'd be somewhat, somewhat different uh, than before, uh, but, but actually just transpo transposed. Um, uh, it would have a kind of similar characteristic though, uh, so we wouldn't feel like we were ramping up our energy to go on to a development section, but instead we're winding it down um, to essentially close out our form. Again, in order to create this contrast uh, between the development section and the recapitulation, we move from heterophonic texture and non-imitative polyphony uh, back to homophonic texture. So the exposition and the recapitulation, whoops, the exposition and the recapitulation are strongly related to one another. In fact, if we were to kind of consider the, the form of the, the piece as a whole, um, the exposition is the, the large scale A section. We have the return of the A section over here. The development, of course, is a huge deviation from the exposition and the recapitulation, different kinds of texture, um, a different kind of aim compositionally. So it's going to indeed be like a large scale 
the section. And kind of to round out the symmetry of our form, if there's an introduction that's included, occasionally we have what we call a coda that's also included. So a coda, just like the introduction, is optional. It's also typically quite short. Again, just like the uh, introduction as well, it's going to reinforce monophonic texture. Having everyone coming together to do the same thing at the same time really makes the piece feel like it's coming to a close. Uh, usually the coda is again monophonic in texture, but also like just a reiteration of the two harmonic areas that were most important in the piece. A sort of alteration of the uh, uh, tonic chord and the dominant chord. So it flip-flops between the tonic and the dominant chord and ultimately resolves. I'm going to put a fermata over that that symbol right there, over the tonic chord. Awesome. So in the largest sense, this, this is, here we go, here's our prototypical diagram. Of Sonata Allegro form. All right, like I said, we're going to go through this form in detail um, through three different pieces, three first movements of three different symphonies. One by Mozart, we're gonna listen to Mozart's Symphony Number no. 40, movement number one, of course. We're gonna listen to Beethoven's Fifth Symphony, movement number one. Everyone knows that one. You should all know what form it's in. Um, in fact, part of the reason why you can remember that piece in the first place is because it uses Sonata Allegro form. It's very clever. Um, the last one that we are going to talk about is Schubert, uh, Franz Schubert's uh, Unfinished Symphony Number Eight, of course. Again, movement number one. We'll talk about about why it wasn't a, a, a finished symphony, a finished product um, when it was all said and done. Uh, uh, and uh, like I said, each of these examples uh, is going to get slightly more complicated. Um, so we're going to start with Mozart, which is the simplest, um, and we're going to talk about all of the deviations that he makes from this prototypical diagram. So I hate to say, even though we went through this um, from start to finish, uh, no composer follows this diagram completely. Um, and we'll talk about why that is uh, when we talk about Mozart's example first. So uh, we'll stop this. Uh, this is a good point to end the first part of our lecture. Uh, the next uh, spot that you pick up um, will be uh, Mozart's Symphony number 40, movement number one. <laughs>